people who have seen me read before will uh, notice a marked difference because uh, when I'm reading or performing as a, an illustrator, I'm usually painted green and I have a colander on my head with two rats hanging off of it. So um, here I have no green paint, it's just kind of me. So this is kind of my first reading with Dead Roads. Um, I did one other reading, which was down at Ad Astra, and I'd just like to thank Derek and thank uh, Matt, because if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have had any books at my first reading because they gallantly drove the car to uh, the FedEx depot where my books were waiting behind the customs line. So it was above and beyond. Uh, Dead Roads, as Matt said, is my first novel, and it's a ghost story, but it's kind of a family drama dressed up as a ghost story. It's the story of a family with three children, Saul, Baz, and Ludi. Uh, I'm often telling it from one of their points of view. Uh, it takes place in, uh, well, starts out in Louisiana, and then it moves up to Nebraska. Uh, the family is a mix of Cajun and Acadian, so I'm going to read uh, a little bit from the prologue, uh, and then I will take us about 15 years uh, up in, in speed. Um, because we're talking about Cajun and Acadians, I'm going to uh, gleefully murder some French. Uh, <laughs> so, um, all of you French speakers and microphones out there, I apologize in advance for what I'm about to inflict upon you. <laughs> so, we're in Louisiana in the early 90s. Ludi didn't know for sure if she could catch a ghost, but she felt better about her chances with Baz at her side. Not that she was going to tell him, of course. She'd been planning this the whole summer, requiring only two things to happen more or less simultaneously. First, her father had to go away for a few days, and then someone else had to do something stupid, like choke on a chicken boat or walk into oncoming un un traffic. On the seventh day of August, her father left the house with a change of clothes and a bag, Saul tied to his side like a little raft. Two days later, their closest neighbor, Old Robichaud, obliged with the stupidity. Some not-so-recent storm had stirred up the cemetery, made a mess of the place. Ludi didn't know which hurricane, their names all sounded like big city dancers. Marble boxes lay scattered about, a giant's birthday party gone wrong, some spun spell that changed the presents and the guests to stone, even the angels. One looked down on her, calm, chilled face, impossible to sex, its wings casting a sheltering shadow as though it might, that might cool her. But Ludi didn't think that angels cared much about shade or heat or mosquitoes or any of those other things that bothered humans here on Earth. Papa had said as much. Her father hardly ever talked about angels, didn't talk about much really, but the old domino players had told her that Ori Sarazen knew all there was to know about angels and devils and everything in between. Baz squirmed beside her, scratching an itch along his spine on the corner of a broken marker. His shoulder blades stuck out like he'd been starved, which was crazy because Baz ate like a big dog with worms. At this year's Cochon de Lay festival, Ludi had seen her brother eat three Bodin sausages in the space of time it would take most people to wash their hands. Ludi was sure Baz wouldn't tell Mama about this, but that didn't mean he wouldn't scare the ghosts away and call her stupid and a baby. Older brothers, even goofy ones like Baz, were made of certain stuff. Baz didn't care at all that he couldn't see ghosts. <clears throat> the talent had skipped over him, which seemed to be A-OK -okay by Baz, even if it gave Saul one more thing to lord over him. Everyone said that Saul was going to be twitter after Papa when he got trained up enough, which left baby Ludi, and she saw everything, angels, devils, and ghosts, her father's daughter for all he noticed. In the bright noon sun of high summer, the ever-present swamp water stank like peanut oil shimmering in a hot pan just down from the cemetery across the road right by the house. Too hot even for water moccasins, maybe too hot for ghosts. 
there weren't many ghosts in most graveyards because her father knew how to send the dead on the proper road home before it got to be about being, before it got to being about ghosts. But Papa had gone to the Atchafalaya Basin, would be gone for a week at least, he said. Papa didn't like leaving Mama alone at home for that long. But the fishing money was good, and Saul was old enough to help this season. Mama had been angry. She'd started talking to herself. Ludi knew that Mama wasn't really talking to herself, because her mother had a secret, didn't she? Mama hid it from Papa, and Saul hadn't noticed, and Baz couldn't see. But Mama had a pet ghost, and if she had one, then Ludi could have one, too. <laughs> In the bright washed out noon sky, the same color as real lemonade, Ludi spotted old Robichaud's ghost, faint as a sinner's hope. The ghost sat across from the stone angel, feet dangling from its own resting place, skinny old man's ass perched on the edge of the new cinder block crypt. He died not 30 feet away on the highway. The ambulance had taken him to the morgue and then brought him back here. Waste of gas, Baz had said. Robichaud's ghost looked a little confused, but that was nothing new. He'd been plenty confused two days ago when he walked in front of a minivan going too fast on its way north. Death apparently made you, <clears throat> hadn't made Robichaud any sharper, and Ludi was saddened for it. She'd been hoping that dying made you smarter. Mama <laughs> always said it did. Beside her, Bass shifted, moved like he was going to bust out of his skin, start walking down the raised highway, just away onto the next thing, not so much annoyed as bored. Baz, Ludi said under her breath, Baz. It was hard to get his attention when he had ants in his pants. Bright green blue eyes on her, unshorn matted hair to his forehead with the heat, white vest clinging damply to him. He smelled of goat, a smile. Quoi? Long and slow, like he had a caramel melting in his mouth, sweet. Not bothered by his sister. Not bothered by the heat. By summer vacation winding down into its last week. School so far away, it might as well be happy in the next century. Sing me a song, she said, twisting a strand of hair around her finger, but keeping her eyes on the ghost, because she sure didn't know what those guys would do when they looked away. A song? Baz repeated, tilting his head, brown, brows rising, teeth gleaming briefly. C'est toi show for singing. Moody knew it was all show. Might as well tell the fish not to swim. It is not Baz. Okay, Mademoiselle, je sais tout. He took a breath, one hand coming up, pinching his nose. He didn't look at her. His eyes were on the angel, Moody realized. Baz never did a single thing quietly, but especially not music. Their mother might hear him from her kitchen window, even way over here across the road. But it was a happy sound, nothing to worry about. Jaunty, an old song, one that Mama sometimes sang, which meant that it was from way up north in Canada, where she said it never got hot like this. Ludi knew all the words about being Acadian, losing your home, being put on a ship, destination unknown. No time like now. Her father was gone, Bass was singing, and Robichaud's ghost happily swayed back and forth to the tune, waiting for a new owner and a dog at the pound. Ludi lay one hand on the ground, like she'd seen Papa do. She closed her eyes, a bead of sweat splattered on the back of her hand. Bringing a ghost in was the opposite of what Ori did. Her father sent them away, slid them off a leash with a gentle command. The old man's ghost came slowly to its feet, Bones shaking beneath sloppy clothes, lines solidifying. To Ludi, Robichaud's ghost seemed like the man always had creaky and addled, and she could see through it to the moss shadow cypress behind. The ghost's face drooped, and Ludi could see how the bones of the left side were broken, smashed across the hood of an out-of-state vehicle in a hurry to get to Tango. Robichaud smiled, and it was wrong. It occurred to Ludi that she should be scared. She hadn't liked the old man in life, and nothing had really changed about that. For a moment, Ludi thought she saw something else move beyond Robichaud, but it was only the wind picking up again, shifting moss in the trees. Then it wasn't. It was a shimmer, soft as milkweed silk, drifting in the breeze. There, if he didn't look at it, gone if he did. It was another ghost. And now Ludi was scared, because Papa said only the newly dead and the angry dead stuck around, and Robichaud was the only recent death she knew of. 
which meant this ghost was the other kind, and she was only seven years old, and that was far too little to deal with an angry ghost. Okay, so we're going to fast forward 15 years from here. Um, a little personal story, as uh, Matt said in my uh, introduction, I'm an adoptee who has been reunited with birth parents, and uh, as part of my process in, in when I was looking for uh, my birth family, I got a, a, an address. I was happily in the Department of Motor Vehicles and managed to, to sweet talk my way into an address that I needed. And I left that office, and this was more than 20 years ago, I left that office with an address in my hand and with um, a decision to make whether I would act on that address or not. And so I kind of used that to, uh, to um, introduce what Baz, now that he's all grown up, is going to do because Baz has been separated from his family for around 15 years from his mother and his sister, um, and uh, he doesn't know where they are. The father has just died, uh, raised Baz and Saul, and Baz really would like to do something about it. So here's Baz about to do something about it. The snow meant Baz didn't drive fast. He told himself that was the reason the police would show a lot of interest in his driving record if they caught up with him, and no insurance would cover the damage Saul would do to Baz if he dented the truck. Saul's truck rumbled slowly along the white street alongside the tracks to the place where they'd been earlier that night. He pulled his brother's cap over his head, deliberate, deliberate and everything now, killing minutes, extending the gap between decision made and decision enacted. Finally, he took a deep breath, shut off the engine, left the keys dangling in the ignition, ready for his return. Without further deliberation, he got out, ducked through the broken fence, and kept to the shadows, breath steaming from him, its own kind of apparition. His mother had used ghosts for her own purposes. That was what Baz understood. She had told fortunes, divined the future. Ori had told him about it, anger in his eyes, explaining why she'd gone and why they weren't going to talk about it. You don't use them, Baz. You let them go, he'd said. Not that Ori had been particularly good at letting go of anything, but Baz understood the principle. The thing was, that meant ghosts were useful, useful for otherwise hidden information. And Baz didn't think his mother was evil, not like Ori had insinuated. He had no idea how the calling of ghosts worked, but he had to try. Their father's ghost was gone. Saul had seen to that. But his brother had also said there were many more ghosts down by the tracks, and the ghosts had come when Baz had sung. They didn't talk about that either, neither brother nor father, why Baz was only allowed to sing in the car. Nobody talked about anything of importance. The sound of metal moving on metal came to him from across the tracks, the smell of cold, of iron. He sang, self-conscious at first, tentative. His heart tripped high in his chest, only the one song, though, before he halted, hunkered down like he'd seen Saul do, one hand on the ground. Screw it, it was like trying to fix an engine blindfolded. Okay, Baz whispered, teeth clattering in the night. Where the hell are you guys? Only the wind and the far call of the engine and train whistle. Another song, and he definitely was unnerved, because ghosts might be all around him and he couldn't see a damn thing. The moon was behind clouds now, and the yard was all lime and smudge and blur. Hey, come on, I need a favor. He felt open, felt seen, felt cold fingers run across his hand. He startled, drew his hand back from the ground, shaking. Wind, maybe. Then, beside him, behind him, beyond the chain link at his back, gravel shifted, scurled. Baz held still, wouldn't see anything, even if he looked. Maybe all this was predicated on not looking. Who knew? Maybe this was his way with the spirits, different from Saul's. As long as it wasn't one of the railroad bulls coming to check out what ba why Baz was in the yard, the gravel crunched again, sound of lifeless bleak density shifting in the night, then a jagged breath, a cancerous intake of air over scar tissue and through blood frothing in the lungs. Baz held very still hand back out against the ground, fingers aching, cold. A favor? 
The question rattled from behind, not a rattle, a chuckle. Baz licked his lips quickly, half hoping it was a cop, telling himself that it was a cop. Yeah, no biggie, uh, just you want to know where she is. No cop. Despite himself, Baz looked. He couldn't see anything at first. And then, behind the chain link, metal holding it back somehow like that might matter, a dark haze as insubstantial as smoke. Still on his haunches, Baz pivoted on the balls of his feet, faced it, though that was the wrong word. There was no face. There was nothing. There was nothing. Are you a ghost? Because this didn't feel like a ghost, and he'd never seen a ghost in his life. The thing just chuckled again, shifted. I don't answer questions. And it drifted down track, away from Baz. No time to second guess what this was, ghost or not. Because he hadn't come here just to drive opportunity away. Wait! And the black smudge stalled. Baz straightened, tried to steady his voice. Yeah, a favor, that's what I need. The sound of amusement came again, covered by a rough cough like the air didn't suit it. Faites attention, meeting is dangerous, Basile Sevesen. Baz's heart banged like a pinball in his chest, and he put his hand to his mouth, blew on it, covering up the shaking. Perceptive for a ghost, if that's what this was. The thing came closer, but didn't seep through the fence, seemed contained, and Baz hoped it was. I don't need to know where she is. I'm just curious. Such a lie, and he wondered if it could tell. Just want to know if she's okay. The thing laughed again. Not so? What are you offering me? Hey, Baz complained, eyebrows inching up. I already gave you two songs. Only the wind again, and Baz couldn't see it, and he wondered if he'd said the wrong thing. Finally, though, like the wind had shifted it, the black smudge appeared again on the periphery down track a little way. As Baz watched, it solidified slightly, crowded along. It didn't move like smoke. It darted, backtracked zigged unnaturally. Despite the keen, freezing air, Baz broke out into a sweat. Your songs? Like he'd served up dog shit. Fine, what do you want then? I'm doing you a favor, boy, it said, but it kept its distance. Being nice. Baz knew that it wasn't, and he found he didn't care. Nice? He repeated, buying time. What do you want? Made him ask twice, and Baz hated that. Want? or need, the thing said, playing, past chiding him about his questions. No, Biggie, it repeated without any trace of humor. We can settle up later. And it shambled away, and Baz let out an involuntary sound of protest like something was being taken from him, wrenched out, a hot dark hand on his chest. The creature stopped, and Baz heard it chuckle again. In your pocket, child dissipated between one moment and the next, maybe between blinks, and Baz shook where he stood, hot and frozen beyond measure, dreading it, head so light, he thought he might blow away or fall down. Baz reached into his coat pocket with a chilled hand, fingers bone white, bloodless, trembling. He withdrew what he found there, a scrap of paper, a ripped corner of unidentified newsprint. Letters and numbers scrawled with a malfunctioning ballpoint pen, an address, his own handwriting, an answer and a promise made in the night, and Baz wondered what he'd be made to pay for this gift.